Hello everybody, this is Jean, also known as Pow Barabba Jaggle. Um, I am going to do a freeform video here that'll probably be really long, like most of my videos are. Um, so, the other day was my birthday, and I posted a video where I went out record shopping, which was nice. That wasn't kind of the main thing I spent my money on, though. The main thing I spent my money on was an electric guitar, which now makes my, at present, third electric guitar that I own. Also, I have an acoustic guitar, um, and I have a few other miscellaneous instruments. And guess what? I'm not a very good player at all, so I'm not going to play for you, <laughs> but I can make chords. That's kind of it. And I've bought myself a little Fender practice amp, like a 20 watt uh, Fender Champion, which I like. Um, so anyway, what I wanted to do was uh, show the guitar I bought, talk about what I know as far as its history and uh, music that I like and collect and uh, am learning about. And, um, yeah, so I suppose the first thing I should do is pick up this thing. So hang on. Okay. I have not mastered the art of, uh, you know, pausing and doing anything like that. So real time. So here it is. Let's see if we can get it in the frame. This is a reissue. I think, um, can you change the year? Uh, I can't quite tell a year on it. Um, I'm going to guess it's probably like a 2016, 2018 maybe that they started making these again. Reissue of a Guild T-Bird um, S200 is the model number. And it goes like this. It's got a lot of switches on it, which makes it kind of unique. Um, this guitar and the whammy bar just fell off, but the whammy bar I don't really need right now. I'll pick it up. There's a little notch on it, and I don't have instructions as far as how to secure it, which um, I'm sure there's a way to, and I'm going to learn. But uh, at the moment, the whammy bar is going to sit there. It's got a Wilkeson tremolo, which is what you use the whammy bar with. Um, it has two modes that you switch between so you can switch up into mode one and that activates just the neck pickup here so you have these two knobs in the back that are the volume and tone for the neck pickup then if you want to switch into mode two you use these two knobs here for volume and tone, and mode two allows you to choose the bridge pickup and the neck pickup. Did I say neck pickup earlier? What did I say earlier? It's the neck pickup that you only access in mode one. In mode two, you can access either just the neck pickup, just the bridge pickup, or both of them. And that's what this is for. This is like up is on for your bridge pickup here. Up is on for your neck pickup here. So right now, because I've got both up, both of these are working. And then this one is a um, tone switch. So it can actually work as a kill switch, which I like because I always like that effect. It's at the end of the Who's Anyway, Anyhow, Anywhere, where the sound just kind of goes whoop, 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 and kind of cuts and then comes back. And that's because, you know, that's how you do that sort of thing on the right sort of guitar that would allow that. Um, so this is kind of a weird design. It only originally was made from, I think, 1963 to 1968. Um, a lot of collectors call it like a Gumby design because it kind of looks like Gumby's head. So it was kind of bizarre and futuristic 
and did not sell as well as some of the competitors, but it's a great guitar. It was kind of meant to compete with uh, some of the Fenders that had all the switching capabilities. I think that's the Jaguar. I think it's the Jaguar with all the switches. I'm not as much of a big Fender fan, even though they're one of the iconic brands. Um, I had a Stratocaster copy as a, you know, a teenager. It was a Sears Stratocaster, probably made in Korea, and it was a good guitar. I just never, it had a really ugly headstock, and that kind of, you know, has made me shy away from Stratocasters. And I like the weird stuff anyway, so probably when I eventually get another single coil pickup guitar, which is what the Strats and the Tellys are, um, I will get some weird brand instead, just to be different. Um, I'm really looking at the Burns guitars, and I'm not particularly a Queen fan, though I don't hate Queen. I've got one Queen album right now, and I might get more, um, but I learned looking into guitars about Brian May's Red Special guitar. I didn't know anything about it, and the whole thing about it really fascinates me because he and his dad built a guitar, and that's the guitar he's pretty much always used. Um, that he, They built it in the 60s, and they used um, pickups from the Burns guitars which were single coil, but then they did a whole bunch of other things. They did this whole switching thing on it where they could, because the Burns guitars were interesting, they uh, kind of had a lot of switches and options between the different models, more so than the Fenders that they were kind of copying. And then Brian May and his father, um, they also, they did a bunch of that sort of switching with those pickups on this strange looking guitar's body, but they did out of phase switching as well. So he had more options on his guitar than even the Burns guitars. And now he makes a line of his guitars. And I'm really tempted to get one because they're fairly affordable. So that might be my single coil guitar. Also, there's a songwriter named uh, Ariel, I think, that he has uh, uh, helped make a version of her guitar, which she built, and it's got a whole bunch of Brian May type electronics on it. So I was looking at maybe getting one of her line of guitars, because they're all in the thousand dollar or less range, which is about what I can afford at best. Anyway, this guitar was um, used uh, by two people particularly in the 60s, Zalianov, Zalianovsky of the Love and Spoonful, the Love and Spoonful guitarist. And any kind of Love and Spoonful video you see, this is what he's playing. Um, if you see the TNT show on here, there's a part where um, the Love and Spoonful starts playing and they mess up, and they laugh, and they start the song, another song again. And he's got that big old thing, and he holds it absolutely horizontally, and uh, I just think that it's so cool. <laughs> but the other person who used this guitar was Muddy Waters. He did not use it as much as Val. It was kind of something that was more um, during the time that he was recording Electric Mud. Um, and maybe it's on After the Rain, too. Um, but there's, uh, I found a video on YouTube where um, it was like a black and white TV appearance that really showed him playing that guitar. Um, and let's see. Then I've heard that uh, the guitarist for the Youngbloods played one of these, which 
I'm not a big young, young blood fan, but uh, you know, I know uh, Get Together, and I know Darkness, Darkness, and that's about it. Um, but not Jesse Colin Young, but uh, their lead guitarist, I guess, played one of the or rhythm guitars. I'm not sure. Then uh, Dan Auerbach from the Black Keys apparently plays one. I got a Black Keys album the other day, and it had a poster in it. And the body of this guitar looks like this guild, but the headstock is wrong. So I don't know whether this is a guild that he replaced the neck on or what's going on. Of course, it's kind of a spotty picture, too. So I don't know that much about the Black Keys, but, you know, it was an excuse for me to pick up a couple of CDs and uh, listen to them and see what I thought, too. So anyway, like I was talking about, here's a book I got recently at Half Price Books that has the 63 Guild Seabird in uh, red. This is that Brian May guitar I was talking about, which is called the Red Special, but this is like a green version. But it has those Burns pickups, and then it has this, you know, pointy headstock, kind of like a Flying V or something. So it's really a weird, rounded guitar. Kind of fascinating. Okay, what else can I tell you? Um, yeah, so I uh, wanted to show you, Glenn Kellaway had wanted to see a bunch of my autographs. They are all over the place, but since I was talking about the Love and Spoonful, and I neglected to mention the song Pow is a Love and Spoonful song, and that's what I use for my, you know, first name on online name or whatever. It's from the Love and Spoonful and last name's from Donovan's Barabajaggle. But when I met John Sebastian, I had several CDs autographed. So this is Tar Beach, which is a really great album. Now this is the more recent edition of it. This is the edition that sometimes you find used. I think this was this was when it came out, it looked like that. For a later uh, John Sebastian solo album, this album's really good. It's right before he started losing his voice, and now he can, he can barely sing. He still tries, and when I saw him, I was really glad I saw him, but, you know, it was, it was hard to hear how bad his voice has gotten. But still, he was just charismatic as ever, and told stories, and played great. So I'm really glad I went. And he also had this collection of kind of children's songs that he had worked on with NRBQ, Tower of Power, and some other people. They were, for a while there, he was making money doing things like music for the Care Bears. Flo and Eddie did that too. Um, all those guys were, there was some animation companies that, uh, was working, I think, out of Woodstock, New York, that they all got associated with. And then this one's awesome. This is a three-disc set that has um, his solo albums, John Sebastian, The Four of Us, Tarzana Kid, and then the Welcome Back album, and then disc three is a DVD of him in concert. Um, in 1970 on BBC TV, which is really good. So if you like 70s John Sebastian, this is the one to get. And everybody knows Welcome Back or whatever, but the, his albums before then were really good songwriter albums, especially, oh, um, Four of Us has a big, long, epic song on side two that's really great. So I love John Sebastian. I love the Love and Spoonful. And, yeah, what I wanted to say was, so, I don't know, about four or five years ago, um, I had decided to kind of get back into, or explore further, more roots-type music, blues, country, things that had influenced a lot of the 60s bands that I really like. So, 
one thing, one video I got. Oh, I've got stacks of videos here. One video I found that's really good that's John Sebastian oriented is called Chasing Gus's Ghost. And if you haven't seen this documentary and you like the Love and Spoonful and you're interested in like the Greenwich Village scenes and uh, roots blues music, this is an excellent documentary. It um, Basically, there was a Love and Spoonful fan who kind of learned that, um, you know, he went back and learned about Gus Cannon and the Cannon's Jug Stompers, um, and then the Memphis Jug Band, and all these 20s jug bands that influenced the Love and Spoonful and influenced the Jim Queskin and uh, there, the Grateful Dead. There's great interviews in here with um, Jim Queskin, Jeff Moldar, John Sebastian, Bill Weir, David Grisman, Maria Moldar. You know, watch this. This is really good. Um, fascinating. Uh, good intro to jug band music. And then it goes into jug band music has this following in Japan, modern day Japan, and all these people with jug bands and it's kind of crazy, but kind of great. So, but I, um, I started collecting, well, lots of blues documentaries because I wanted to learn more about, you know, Muddy Waters and all the Chicago blues guys, Buddy Guy, um, you know, um, oh, come on. sorry, I'm, I'm, Spacing on harmonica player. <laughs> I'll remember it anyway. Uh, but you know, uh, Bloomfield and Sam Lay and all those guys. Um, yeah, Paul Butterfield. That's who I was trying to think. Of. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I kind of was teaching myself about a bunch of that by just getting video after video. This one though, I really love. It's, well, this Howlin' Wolf documentary is awesome. That is a cool one. Um, I really recommend it if you can find this. I, I really kind of fell in love with Howlin' Wolf's music in the process. So, more so than Muddy Waters, even though, you know, Muddy Waters, I, I understand. is lots of people's favorite bluesmen. But these folk festival comps... So, these are, were filmed, like it says, British Tours 63 to 66. These are fantastic. And, you know, for years and years, you'd see, like, Beatles clips where they're at these certain festivals, and they're kind of in the round and all this. And it was, you know, the same show with all the bluesmen. I, I was kind of shocked that, of course, I knew all this British invasion stuff, but I didn't kind of see the other side of it at the time, you know, because I used to have videos that would have the searchers or, you know, everybody, um, even like the liver birds or whatever on uh, some black and white show on a VHS tape. And I just didn't have all the same stuff that was being broadcast that was blues oriented but of course I knew all like the animals or rolling stones or kinks or whatever but appearances so what I was kind of leading up to was I started also picking up videos that were instructional videos and I've got a John Sebastian one somewhere but I can't find it but there's things like this how to play blues guitar and then they pick you know a certain person like uh, Reverend Gary Davis, and it's usually taught by Stephen Grossman, who was associated with John Sebastian early on in a band called, oh, now I'm going to blank on it. Um, lots, of imp lots of the Moldars were in it. Um, mm, sorry, I have it somewhere. Should have brought it out here but i saw a vinyl copy of that album recently i'm going to go back and pick it up 
um, and I'll show it off some other time when I get it. But Stephen Grossman really kind of intrigued me. I hadn't heard of him before, and he would hang around with Reverend Gary Davis and Mississippi John Hurt and just kind of take guitar lessons from them and learn, you know, their guitar styles. And then he would do all this annotating and, you know, kind of transcribing it for the music community as an archivist stuff. So he's fascinating. Um, and I've gotten a number of his albums through that. But I also just kind of would get instructional things on how to play the mandolin and how to play the fiddle and all this stuff that from more of a blues or um, folk perspective. And then you find stuff like this. Joe Walsh teaching you how to play guitar, which is hilarious. You know, Joe Walsh trying to teach you guitar is just funny to begin with. So Joe Walsh fans should own this video. Find it on eBay. <laughs> So I don't know, that's just a bunch of random stuff, but I just got kind of into collecting instructional stuff. Oh, here's here's the Reverend Gary Davis story document documentary. So that's that's really good. Of course, lots of great the Grateful Dead is all over it. Um, and here's one that's Sun House and Lead Belly and Bessie Smith clips and you know these there's just such great comp compilation videos out there. Gets me into chasing down other artists. And, you know, there was a part in that um, Howlin' Wolf documentary where he's frustrated with um, Sun House because Sun House has been drinking too much or something. And it's a really interesting clip to see those two interacting in that video. And that's that's one of the most memorable things about that whole documentary. Well, I don't know. I just went on and on and I love my new guitar. <laughs> but here's the headstock. I see it. It's like, you know, got the whole mother of pearl thing. I mean eight hundred and fifty bucks plus tax. So glad I got this because I just have a feeling that you know, there's only a limited audience for this sort of guitar. It's not your classic Les Paul or whatever. It's kind of a niche guitar. And that means they tend to go out of, out of uh, print because they don't sell enough. But they re reissued this. Oh, and if you watch, um, like, videos of the Monkees show, um, there's a bass they made that they called the Jet Star Bass, which is this body shape. Also, you know, a tobacco antique first finish like this. It didn't have all the switches, but uh, usually that's what either Peter Tork was playing or on some of them, Davy Jones has it too. They didn't reissue the bass. I was kind of disappointed, but they reissued uh, the Jet Star um, guitar, which looks different. It doesn't have this whole gumby shape. It's more like an SG with a cut-off bottom. And then there's the uh, Guild Polaris, which looks like an SG, a Gibson SG. And otherwise, there haven't been a lot of kind of glass, classic Guild solid bodies. They made some in the 70s and 80s, but Guild is really known for its acoustic guitars. After the 60s, they kind of, um, you know, focused more on the acoustic guitars. So, that's that. I also, uh, oh, let me put this down. Got, uh, some things to clean up my, uh, oils and stuff to treat the fingerboard on my uh, guitar. So today I was oiling this Harley Benton that I got that's the 12 string. The fake Rickenbacker. I love this one. I can't believe this was a, you know, $220 guitar or whatever. And I got my SG all cleaned up today too. Here's the SG. 
really looks good after I burn it. So I've had this for years, and I never, you know, knew what to do as far as cleaning and care and stuff. So I've been trying to educate myself on that and, you know, oiled the fretboard. I mean, it was so dry. But that's what the, the Harley Benton derived with the really dry fretboard. I think it has kind of poor quality wood for its fretboard, but if you keep it oiled, it should be okay and not dry out. So. Am I in tune? Kinda. Not very in tune. Sort of in tune. There we go. Thanks for watching.